Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Mushfik Mubarak, a professor of economics. He conducts field experiments exploring ways to induce people in developing countries to adopt technologies or behaviors that are likely to be welfare improving. His ongoing research projects are in Bangladesh, Brazil, Chile, India, Kenya, Nepal, and Malawi. Professor Mubarak's work has been published in numerous journals across disciplines, including Econometrica, Science, the Review of Economic Studies, the American Political Science Review, and Demography. Today, we'll talk with Professor Mubarak about breaking the hunger cycle in Bangladesh. Welcome, Professor Mubarak. Thank you for having me. Let's begin with the paper that was published in uh, Econometrica um, dealing with the migration and poverty in Bangladesh. Give us an overview of sure, it. Sure. I should start with explaining why there is seasonal poverty. So it okay. turns out that about 300 million people in the world at least, even though they might not be chronically poor, they suffer from seasonal hunger. Mm -hmm. right? And this has to do with the agricultural crop cycle. So you know, farmers plant during a certain month, I'll use the Bangladesh calendar in August, they harvest in January. And the period in between, it, you're basically just waiting for the crop to grow. So there's some work, but not much. So labor demand falls. So people who are landless, who rely on work on other people's farms, right? So their wages fall. And it also unfortunately, be, unfortunately happens to be the time when the price of rice spikes up. Okay. So this combination of high prices and low wages means that caloric intake goes down. Right? And this takes the form of a seasonal famine. So that's okay. true in Bangladesh, uh, f in between the rice growing season. But it's also true in other countries where I work. Like in Malawi, it's called the hungry season. Okay. In Eastern Island of Indonesia, it has a different name, but it's the same phenomenon. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, how, the way that the governments or NGOs who work on this problem, uh, the way they try to address it is by doing either free or subsidized food distribution or food for work programs, trying to create some employment in that area. Mm -hmm. right? um, now, those uh, mechanisms are quite expensive for poor countries, right? And also there are some structural reasons why jobs don't exist in okay. that area. So my idea was instead of trying to force job creation where the economy doesn't support it, why not move people to where the jobs are? So okay. perhaps moving people is going to be cheaper than moving jobs. So, uh, so I followed up on that by uh, conducting a randomized control trial where you know, I tr uh, use treatment groups versus control groups mm -hmm. to offer a uh, certain kind of program to people and then track what happens. Okay. And in this case, I encourage people to move. Uh, so in some villages, I offered them the equivalent of about $11, $12, uh, which paid for a round trip bus fare plus a few days of food. Okay. Right? In other villages, I offered them information on where they could go. Right? And then I had a control group where I collected data but did not have the same thing. Mm -hmm. okay? And then I tracked what, what, went, uh, what happened next. Okay. Okay, so it turns out the three bottom line results are, first, if you provide people with some uh, money, either the form of grant or a loan for the travel cost, uh, you can induce people to go. So about a quarter of households try this out, they send a seasonal migrant right, for the period that, uh, that's a lean season at home. Right? And when they go, uh, their families consume six to 700 calories per person per day more. Right? Okay. So they move from two meals a day to three meals a day, so which is a remarkably large effect. Right, right. And the third thing that happened is a year later and three years later, I continued tracking people in these areas, but I did not repeat the program. Okay. And a lot of the people who we induced to move back in 2008 uh, chose to go back again in 2009 and 2011. And, and then why were they doing it? It turns out that most of the people who we induced, um, they go back and work for the exact same employer that they had met back in 2008. Okay. So what led you? to do this kind of research? So I grew up in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. and uh, so this is a problem that I grew up with. Uh, okay. I mean, not in my family, I was in a city household, but sure. it's a problem that uh, most, most of us knew about and the government was paying attention to. Okay. Um, so this is something I'd been curious about. Mm -hmm. And as an economist, the curiosity comes from the fact that this is a, an entirely predictable shock. Okay? So how is it that when a shock happens year after year, that people are not adjusting mm -hmm. And, um, and still suffering the consequences of this famine. Okay, right? so what were some of the reasons why, um, prior to your research, that someone wouldn't move? Excellent, uh, so that's exactly where the research went next. Mm -hmm. right? So we did the research that I just described and we found those results, and then the social scientists and me would ask the question, why did we have to run this program? You know, if this was so, such a good idea in terms of you could get people to go, they eat more, 
they go back again on their own, so they should have been going already. Right. Right? The program should not have been necessary. Right? So then we go back to economic theory. So we then try to understand, okay, why was this phenomenon existing? Mm -hmm. Why were people not moving? Okay? So here's the simple story that comes out of the theory. Uh, I won't use math here. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank I'll just tell you, you the story. <laughs> <laughs> And so imagine I were to offer you a lottery ticket. It costs about $11. Mm -hmm. okay? And I tell you that about 80% of the time, it'll pay off. Okay? And you'll get a lot of money back. You'll get $40, $50 back. Okay? But 20% of the time, it won't pay off. Mm -hmm. Would you want to buy that ticket? Of yes. course, because it's a great deal. Yes. <laughs> uh, however, now imagine I told you it's the same ticket, except imagine that you're under the threat of famine, uh, and your family is very close to subsistence. right? And there's a risk that if you are $11 poorer, that you buy a ticket and it doesn't pay off, right? And you return home empty-handed, right? That something devastating might happen. Right. Would you buy that ticket under those circumstances? No. no. So that's what's going on. So right. even though the upside opportunity is great, people cannot chase those opportunities just because they're not managing the downside risk. Mm -hmm. So the way that the program ended up working is that it was actually working as insurance, not as a grant, mm -hmm. right? We were insuring people's travel and that made them feel comfortable, helped them get over their risk aversion and chase the upside opportunity. And about 80% of the time, it did work out. So those numbers I gave are actually from the data in the okay. study. So I'm curious, how many villages did you look at for the research? Uh, so we worked in, uh, we started at 100 villages mm -hmm. and we uh, increased over the course of three years to about 133. Wow. Um, and uh, the original sample was working with about 2,000 households and that increased to about 3,000 by, mm -hmm. by the end of the three years. Okay, and how, how did the, the people in the cities and towns know about the research? How did you get the word out or how did you get people to participate? Ah, so uh, we uh, work with local NGOs who actually provide lots of services in those areas and they have great local presence. Mm -hmm. So this is all done in collaboration with local institutions mm -hmm. who are interacting with the uh, villages on a regular basis, say providing microcredit. Ah, I see, okay. And now I'm also curious, um, how do they find the jobs to go to? And what um, kind of jobs were they? Yeah, so it turns out that a lot of people already migrated even without us being there. So about 35% of the households were mm -hmm. migrating. So real, the effect that I was talking about is really moving that from 35% to about 60%. Okay. Okay. So the people who already were going, that first 35%, they usually have pre-existing connections to employers because they've traveled in the past, or they might have some social network support, family support in the destination. Mm -hmm. okay. And it's interesting that the people we were able to induce to move, that 60 minus the 35, Right? they were the people who did not have those services available. Okay. So that was actually part of the risk, which is I don't really have a connection, I don't really have any support, right? It's too risky for me to go. Mm -hmm. And so for those people, this program acted as a substitute form of insurance. Right, right, okay. So um, ultimately, what do you conclude in your paper? So um, the important bottom line here is that we now have an understanding of why people weren't going and that this actually is kind of like a poverty trap, mm -hmm. which is that there are nice opportunities available for you. However, you're so poor that you cannot take the risk to uh, pursue those opportunities, mm -hmm. right? And that itself is what's keeping people poor, okay. right? So, so what this program does, it's helping people break out of that cycle, okay. right? By ensuring their risk. Okay, yeah. through microfinancing to a certain extent, correct? Ex exactly. So right. except that, you know, traditionally you think about microfinance as the story that's told is, oh, people want to uh, start businesses. Mm -hmm. We give them microfinance, they're entrepreneurs at heart, and, um, you know, as soon as you give them some capital, they start a business and they sell the product, right? It turns out that story is a myth. So most people in the world are not entrepreneurs, right? Okay. Just like you and me, they want steady jobs. Right. right? So this is, <laughs> this is a case where... Um, you know, you can use the microfinance type concept, right, but allow people to do what the majority of people actually want to do. Okay, and what do you think this um, uh, can help moving forward? So, um, How can this help moving forward? Sure. So this was originally a, um, you know, a randomized controlled trial, a research study, mm -hmm. uh, with only, as I said, 2,000 to 3,000 households. Okay. Now, uh, the reaction to this was people who read the work, uh, including some very nice, rich people from Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. um, as well as an organization that scales up programs called Evidence Action. Okay. Right? So they approached me saying, um, oh, we should be thinking about uh, scaling up this program because it's 
seems to be effective development policy. Right. Right? So I was enthusiastic that somebody's paying attention. However, I was also a little bit apprehensive that, look, I, you know, I, my reaction to them was, look, I showed you these results with two, 3,000 households, and it works well for those families. However, if you start inducing 20,000 people, 30,000 people, or 200,000 people, it may not work in the same way. So for example, if you move lots of people out, uh, maybe you know, if all the able-bodied men leave, some social scientists in the past have expressed concerns that perhaps that makes the or origin village much more vulnerable. Okay. Right? Or you might worry that if you send lots of people into the city, they might stress the city's intake capacity. Mm -hmm. right? Or if there are enough jobs available, too. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah, so it could be intake in terms of jobs. It could be in terms of the sanitation situation or housing situation. Sure. Right? And the, another set of worries that I, that I expressed to them uh, has to do with unintended consequences. So I told you a number of results here about the economic effects, but mm -hmm. it could be that you know, when people move to the city, they come back with new ideas. Their political beliefs might change, or they might come back with a health problem, right? And it might lead to more um, transport of health issues from rural and back to, or from ur urban back to rural areas. Mm -hmm. uh, or it might change husband, you know, relationship between the husband and the wife. Sure. If the husband's away, right? Uh, could lead to divorce. Right. Uh, and it could have effects on kids if the migrant, uh, typically a male, is away from the family for a while. Right. Right? So, so then the next step was to say, look, these are the concerns, and they're real concerns if you think about scale up. So we should be thinking about each of these problems and studying them carefully before we launch a big program to scale this, scale this uh, idea up. And so that's exactly what we did. Um, and so I'll give you a quick flavor sure. of, of how, this, how this works. So imagine, you know, to, in order to understand the effect on the rural area, so we move from a sample of 3,000 to an area with 30,000 people. Okay? So we've scaled up by 10 times. Right. And in order to study the effect on the rural area, what I did was, in some villages, I induced lots of people to move, in, in fact, up to 70% of wow. the people. And in some villages, I induced only a few people, so it turns out to be about 35, 38%. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, with that variation, you can now see if lots of people move out, what happens to the rest of the people remaining in the village? Mm -hmm. And that helped me answer those questions about what the spillover effects are mm -hmm. on the village. And what you find is actually even more good news. right? Really? And the good news is when lots of people move out, then there's less competition for the scarce jobs at home. Mm -hmm. right? So you see that wages rise because now employers need to pay more in order to get workers. Mm -hmm. right? And the people remaining at home, they, uh, they have an easier time finding employment. Mm -hmm. So they're not as hungry. The, their income goes up. Okay. Mm -hmm. But what happens when everyone comes back? And typically, uh, how long? I, we didn't talk about how, how long, long they're away for. Right. So it's typically the, that period, uh, the pre-harvest lean season period, mm -hmm. is about a three-month period. And typically, people go for a few weeks. And in fact, they come back after, say, three or four weeks uh, because they want to bring money back home mm -hmm. and they want and to see, see their, their family. family. Sure. Right? And then they go again a second time. So I actually, in that migrant sample, I observe about 1.9, two trips per family uh, okay. during that period. Okay. And so when they come back, so um, then we tracked you know, effects on husband-wife relationships. We tracked if, like, these kinds of sociological effects, mm -hmm. uh, health issues. We track political changes, political beliefs changes, right? And also how the decision making within the household might change, mm -hmm. right? It turns out in general, there are not, nothing interesting going on. It's all a set of zero effects. Wow. Right? And the reason is, um, so I'll tell you the simple story that, okay, the weeks that the husband is away, of course, by definition, the wife makes more decisions, mm -hmm. right? However, as soon as he comes back, it goes back to status quo. So okay. it's not like this is a program that will increase women's empowerment. Right? Well, that is interesting, though, because yeah. I'm wondering if that will hold over time. Yeah, so uh, I think it's because, you know, women's empowerment or husband-wife position within a family, mm -hmm. these are things that are determined over centuries. Right? right. And I suspect an intervention that makes somebody move a few, for a few weeks is not going to be powerful enough okay. for us to do this. Okay. So, so that, that was another myth that came out of the microfinance literature. They claimed that that's what yeah. was happening. But I, interesting. But I think it's... Uh, like in the, the, the large sample data does not really bear it out. Okay. And are you looking to apply this model to other countries? I know you're working in several other countries. Uh, yes. So now that we feel a lot more comfortable, so in Bangladesh, we are, I'll call it a scale up phase, right? So in the next uh, four years, we will be um, making offers to about a half a million households. 
Wow. Um, trying to induce about 300,000 people to move. So that's the level of funding that we have there. Right, right. And this is being conducted by uh, Evidence Action mm -hmm. in partnership with one of the NGOs that we originally worked with in the, in the study who has very good local presence. Okay, right. you mean in Bangladesh? That's in Bangladesh. But are you doing it in other countries? Yes. And also well. in other countries we're going to, yeah, we're looking at replication. And the second place we're going to is in eastern Indonesia. Mm -hmm. So Indonesia is a richer country than Bangladesh, but the eastern islands, like just north of Australia, Right, those are very poor places okay. where the same phenomenon of seasonal hunger exists. So we've been working there uh, for the last few years in partnership with the government there, mm -hmm. the planning ministry. And we are now launching the project in uh, the uh, uh, Indonesian part of Timor. Uh, okay. It's a province called NTT. Mm -hmm. And then just uh, two weeks ago, I was in Sulawesi at another island in Indonesia with a group of Yale students. Okay. And we were exploring the possibilities there. Ah, OK, interesting. So we'll look forward to seeing what goes on there too. Um, final question, you know, in reading the Financial Times, you know, I originally saw the coverage of, of your work there, and it describes it as an example for how, uh, for how intelligent international development and ph philanthropy philanthropy should be done. So my question to you are what are the lessons that we can draw um, from this for other research and phil philanthropic projects? So I think one important lesson is uh, that we shouldn't take a result even if it looks very promising and immediately start applying it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. right? uh, each place is different sure. right? and the one-size-fits-all policy might not work. So for example when I went to Indonesia I learned uh, that in Timor, even though people are hungry before the harvest, over there people actually have land, unlike in Bangladesh where mm -hmm. most people are landless, right? But the land quality is low. So because they have land, they need to stay back home between planting and harvest to do the little bit of task like weeding, okay? Right. So they don't want to migrate then, even though that's when they're hungry, okay. right? And so what we learn is that they're actually willing to mi migrate after the harvest when they're free, they have more free time, thinking ahead to the fact that they will be hungry in the next pre-harvest season, right? Mm -hmm. So the program design changed. Okay. And then we also explored um, a replication in Malawi and Zambia. So I actually sent, I mean, we did some exploration, sent a Yale student there to spend the summer. Right? And there we learned that in Malawi, it turns out that there is no city with a vibrant labor market okay. that can uh, absorb migrants. Sure. Right? And so we just stopped our activities there right away. Um, so I think, um, you know, thinking about the local conditions, right? And then also thinking carefully about, okay, if I do a study with 3,000 households, how will the results be systematically different if we do the program with 30,000 or 300,000 households? That's really important. Mm -hmm. And those are the types of questions that the government should be asking, right? right. Uh, we do research because we want to inform larger scale policy, not to just stop with the research, right? But now I think we all now need to start developing the science behind scaling up interventions, right? So if we take a small scale research result, is there, can we immediately apply it to a large scale or what are the set of systematic problems that we'll face and how do we uh, address those questions. Right, right, because so much money, I think, especially previously, money is thrown at a, pro at a problem mm. and, you know, there's no real understanding I mean, of what was going on, on or any follow-up. So I think mm. what you're doing is very important. Uh, thank you. Yes, yeah. and so the data are important, but this last thing that I said about systematically thinking about the science suggests that we also need to go back to economic theory, right, and talk to not just people who analyze data, but people who think about the theory of change. Exactly. So thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing your work. Thank you very much. For more information about Professor Mubarak and his work, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.